everyone. Welcome to workshop 25, Food and Security Innovations. We're so glad you chose to join us today to talk about this important topic. We're delighted to have these five speakers sharing their impressive work. My name is Kristen Clem. I work with the Cystic Hypertis Foundation and I co-lead the CF Food Security Committee. My co-moderator is Emily Russell. She's a senior clinical dietitian at Texas Children's Hospital. For this workshop, I'll be on screen moderating the Q&A and Emily will be monitoring our chat, feeding me questions, and providing support behind the scenes. We encourage you to submit your questions in the box to the right throughout the presentations. We'll have about eight minutes to respond to questions after each presentation. So let's get started. Our first presenter is Marissa Rollins. Marissa is an employee of the CF Foundation, currently pursuing her master's degree in public health with a focus on nutrition and food security. She's a member of the CF Foundation Food Security Committee and works on the resource development subgroup. Marissa will be presenting on fostering patient-centered resources for food insecurity. Hello, my name is Marissa Rollins and I'll be presenting today on fostering patient resources for food insecurity. I have no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. To start, I'd like to give a little bit of background about food insecurity and cystic fibrosis. Food insecurity is noted in 33% of people with CF, which is three times the rate of the general US population. Of note, this data is pre-COVID and pre-Trikapta, and this rate may have changed in that time. With this data in mind, the Resource Development Group of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation's Food Security Committee sought to understand how people with CF who are food insecure prefer to receive resources and support with the goal of informing and prioritizing the creation of patient-centered resources or CF care teams that address food insecurity. To provide input for this project, we disseminated a survey fielded through CF Foundation's Community Voice. A total of 1,134 people were sent the survey. This included adults with CF, parents or caregivers of children with CF, spouses of a person with CF, immediate family members of a person with CF, and those who lost a loved one to CF. We received 140 responses to the survey. Here you can see the breakdown of respondents. The majority of respondents were white or Caucasian with 132 individuals, comprising approximately 91% of the responses. Other responses came from people who are Hispanic or Latinx, eight individuals making up 5% of the sample, African-American or Black, one individual making up 1% of the sample, Native American, three individuals making up 2% of the sample, and an individual who chose none of the above. Looking at relationship to CF, you can see people with CF made up more than half of the sample with 86 individuals, followed by caregivers and parents making up approximately 38% of the sample, and the rest of the sample being spouses, immediate family members, or those who lost a loved one to CF. One thing to note is that individuals were able to select all that applied to them from both of these demographic questions. Respondents were also asked about their food security status. The yellow and green bars signify hunger vital signs questions, and the blue is a question we added to the survey. Only the yellow and green bars were considered when determining who in the sample was food insecure. 30 unique individuals out of the 140 respondents were in the food insecure category, equating to 21% of the sample. However, we did not make these hunger vital sign questions mandatory, and 54 individuals skipped these questions. Therefore, the food insecurity rate from this survey may actually be higher than results show. There were several important findings from the survey that stood out in three topic areas. Over the next few slides, you'll see these blue and yellow bars. The blue bars signify the full sample and the yellow bars signify the food insecure sample. So when individuals were asked who they would contact if they needed help with food insecurity, the top three answers were a local community resource, the CF care team social worker, and community or religious support groups. This highlights the importance of a trusted relationship with, with the care team social worker, as 40% of individuals with CF who are food insecure selected this, in, this option. The next finding was around communication. When respondents were asked how they would like to receive information about food insecurity, 
The top selections by people who are food insecure was through email, website, or patient portal. All of these selections are web-based and they could have been preferred due to a level of anonymity and less perceived stigma or ease of use. Another key takeaway from the survey was about what resources respondents preferred. Those who are food insecure preferred grocery store gift cards, a food box mailed to the home, or to use a food pantry. Again, factors such as less perceived stigma, autonomy of choice, increased anonymity, and ease of use could have factored into these choices. Of note, no one who identified as food insecure selected the option that they did not need any of these resources. When asked about the likelihood of using a food pantry located within the CF clinic or hospital, those who are food insecure were more likely to answer varying degrees of yes than to say they would not use it. We also asked about the impact of COVID-19 on household food status. 50% of the food insecure sample said that their food status had worsened, 10% said their food status had remained the same, and 15% said that their food status had improved. We had several key takeaways from the survey, including the importance of a trusting, safe relationship between care teams and patients, and in particular, the care team social worker. Sensitive conversations, autonomous choice, and ease of access were also important. The results emphasize that people in the CF community are aware of food insecurity, but there continues to be stigma around needing food. As part of our goal for the survey and one of the outcomes, we are currently developing two documents to help care teams support their patients and families. The first is a unique intervention document that houses a collection of unique interventions from care centers across the country used to address food insecurity. This is a living document. If you have a unique intervention you use within your population, you can contact us via the email on the next slide. We are also in the process of developing a how to start a food pantry document. This document was informed by eight key informant interviews with uh, individuals at CF care centers who have food pantries and was conducted by members of the Food Security Committee. After analyzing themes, we summarized several key takeaways, including barriers, drivers, opportunities, partnerships, and more within the document. If you are looking for resources that are currently available, there are several you can utilize. The first is the Food and Security Discussion Aid. This aid is a relationship-centered communications tool to be used during a CF clinical encounter. The second is a food, and security sum or food security summary, which incorporates data updated on food insecurity, as well as the connection between food insecurity and mental health. This food and security handout for clinicians contains tips, ideas, and resources so you can help support your food insecure patients and families. While it's not an exhaustive list, it is a good place to start. This handout, Let's Talk About Food, is an educational resource for people with cystic fibrosis about food insecurity. It discusses what food insecurity is, what the impacts are, and normalizes experiences. The other pages of this handout include resources and a notes section so patients and families can take notes on local resources. The Food Assistance Resources Flowchart is a document that provides suggestions of resources and factors to consider when making a referral to a food resource. The Patient Assistance Programs document provides information about pharmaceutical assistance programs. All of the resources that are listed here can be found in the my.cff resource library. If you're looking for one but can't find it, please email foodinsecurity at cff.org. There are also several resources currently in progress by the Food Security Committee, several of which will be available at the end of 2021. These include the two documents I mentioned that are currently being worked on as a result of this survey, the How to Start a Food Pantry and Unique Food and Security Interventions documents, as well as a presentation on federal food programs and patient advocacy tips. Coming in 2022 will be the Food Insecurity Quality Improvement Change Package, as well as a webinar on screening sensitively for food insecurity. Thank you for your time. Here are my, re my references. Thank you, Marissa. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing these findings and for the reminder of approaching topics like food insecurity with sensitivity. 
Um, so we're gonna go ahead and start with a couple questions. Why do you think so many individuals skip the food insecurity questions on the survey? Thanks, Kristen. Um, I'm really happy to be here and to have presented on the work that the resource development subgroup did. Uh, it's very important work. Um, to answer your question, so we didn't make this question mandatory, but it's it's really hard to say exactly why people skip this question. Um, 54 is a big number out of the 140. It could have been a number of things, including um, time constraints, stigma, or, or unwillingness to share the information, despite the anonymity of the survey. So I don't want to surmise incorrectly, but with the stigma that still permeates use of social safety nets and food insecurity resources, that, that could be potential reasons why people skip that question. All right, we have a question on here. How do CF care teams work with their hospital legal department to be able to give out gift cards? Um, this person said their legal department says that it'll be viewed as an incentive. Um, I, think, I think we have some speakers later um, during this workshop that will we work in care centers and we'll have great responses to this. So I encourage our later speakers to please answer this question as well. Um, Marissa, do you have anything you want to share? Um, so as far as, uh, as, as that goes, I, I'm not at a care center myself, so it's hard for me to, to, to provide an answer with that, but I am looking forward to seeing what the speakers later on have to share. Thanks, Marissa. Great. And you mentioned several resources that are available in the my.cff resource library. Are there other food insecurity resources as well? There are, yes. Um, so there are, there's a plethora of materials on food insecurity in, in the my.cff resource library um, that can be found just by searching with the simple food insecurity or food security search term. Uh, some of those resources that I mentioned that were upcoming are actually available as of this last week. Uh, so that, that advocacy uh, resource is available in the resources library. It's called the Food Security Champion uh, resource, as well as an updated food security summary that uh, was updated with uh, inclusion of information on the intersection of CF and mental health. And then that unique interventions document that I talked about, which was a deliverable of uh, of this work that this subgroup did is also now available. And uh, I won't spoil it all, but it's a document that contains info on unique interventions care teams are using to support their patients and families who need food assistance. And a couple um, unique interventions included in there are food box programs and gleaning, and there's a few other ones, but uh, that is also available uh, in the my.cff resource library. Fantastic, thanks, Marissa. And how do you work with or encourage centers to work with community-based organizations that address food insecurity? Uh, for example, programs like Meals on Wheels. Yeah, so I think this is going to vary from center to center um, as, you know, what connections they have and what local resources there are. Um, we do have a handout that we created uh, specifically for uh, care team clinicians that is about food insecurity, and it has um, some local and national resources that are available if you're interested in checking out kind of what's more around you. Um, there are typically partners that you can reach out to within those organizations that you can work with to support patients and families. And one more question for you. <clears throat> are there suggestions for managing difficult conversations and clinical encounters around food insecurity? Um, like yes like what might be suggested in the PEP program? Yeah, so there is a PEP uh, discussion aid specifically for food insecurity and how, how to have those, those sensitive conversations without bringing in feelings of stigma and to really, to really normalize the experience. Like I said at the beginning of this presentation, uh, food insecurity in CF occurs um, at three times the rate of the general population. So, so it is it is normal um, for food insecurity to be experienced, unfortunately, in this population. Um, so understanding how to have sensitive conversations with patients and families is very important. And that, that PEP discussion aid that I'm referencing is available as well in the uh, resource library. So I would definitely recommend checking that out uh, to kind of uh, be become more comfortable with having that uncomfortable conversation with patients and families. All right. Well, thank you so much, Marissa. <clears throat> if there are thank any you. other questions that come up for Marissa, um, we encourage you to reach out to her. 
We'll move on to our next presentation. So our next presenter is Christine Durkin. Christine is a clinical psychology intern at Alpert Medical School at Brown University and a doctoral candidate in her sixth and final year of training at West Virginia University's Clinical Child Psychology PhD program. Her clinical and research interests involve doctor-parent-child communication, behavioral interventions to promote positive health behavior in pediatric populations, transition of regimen responsibility from parents to youth, and the psychosocial functioning of children with chronic illnesses and injuries. Her dissertation and the focus of today's presentation is on evaluating barriers to nutritional adherence in adolescents with CF. She was awarded a Ruth L. Hirschstein National Research Service Award Individual Predoctoral Fellowship by the NIH National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. She was also awarded the CF Foundation Student Traineeship Award and the American Psychological Association Dissertation Award for this project. Hello. My name is Christine Durkin, and today I'll be discussing food security and nutritional adherence in adolescents with cystic fibrosis during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I have no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. Although some research exists investigating factors associated with nutritional adherence in patients with cystic fibrosis, it is primarily focused on young children or on adults and individual and family level factors ignoring the broader societal context for youth and adolescents specifically. Social determinants are shaped by distribution of resources and are common causes of health inequities. They are defined as the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And they include things such as food security and access to food sources such as grocery stores. If our interventions are to be effective, researchers must consider the ways in which societal determinants differentially impact how patients engage with and adhere to the content of their interventions. Therefore, more information is needed to better understand how social determinants of health, such as food security, may moderate adherence in adolescents with cystic fibrosis. 10.5% of families in the U.S. experienced food security in 2019 to 2020. Overall, households with children had substantially higher rates of food insecurity than those without children. Food insecurity had been steadily decreasing over the past several years. However, numbers are expected to increase following the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, such that researchers project that one in six children may be experiencing food insecurity in 2021. So how does this relate to patients with cystic fibrosis? Well, specific diets are a part of the treatment regimen for CF, from tube feedings to specialized meal plans, and the patient sees a dietitian at least once a year in clinic to discuss eating habits. Therefore, access to food is of critical importance. Recent studies have identified an association between families of children with CF and food insecurity. Rates of food insecurity among this population range from double to triple to that of the general population. Further preliminary research suggests that food insecurity may have increased among patients with CF during the pandemic. The CF Foundation Compass Program received 174 requests for food assistance in 2019 to 2020, and food requests almost tripled between 2019 and 2020. Thus far, little research exists that evaluates food insecurity in adolescent patients. With CF, despite the fact that the CF care regimen translates into substantial costs associated not just with the medical treatments themselves, but also in this increased nutritional intake. It is likely that unique circumstances associated with the COVID-19 pandemic may impact nutritional adherence in youth with cystic fibrosis, particularly stay-at-home orders, changes in health care delivery systems, and how kids attended school. Therefore, this study aims to investigate the relation of COVID-19 pandemic experiences reported by families and their home's food security to nutritional adherence in adolescents with cystic fibrosis. The current study is a secondary analysis of an ongoing F31 project, which takes a mixed methodological approach to investigating factors associated with nutritional adherence in adolescents with CF. The project is called the CF Teens Talk Study. 40 adolescents ages 12 to 17 and their caregivers recruited from five geographically diverse CF centers around the country. Recruitment occurred between June 2020 and October 2021. 
Inclusion criteria were that the child's primary caregiver agrees to participate. The patient was diagnosed for at least six months with CF. There was no evidence of significant cognitive impairment for child or caregiver. The patient had no comorbid diagnosis that would have significantly impacted weight, and the caregiver and the patient were English speaking. Recruitment procedures were as follows. Each site had a site coordinator who identified patients meeting medical and demographic eligibility criteria through a medical chart review. They then provided information to the eligible families about the study during a clinic visit, and they ascertained interest in participating. The site coordinator instructed families to complete a consent to contact form, which was then uploaded onto a secure server, which was accessed by the WVU research team. The team contacted families within a few days via email and by phone to answer questions and to obtain consent. Once families completed an informed consent, adolescents and caregivers each completed a battery of questionnaires through REDCap. Adolescents then completed two 24-hour diet recalls by phone or through video conferencing platform. Finally, site coordinators completed a data poll of the adolescent's medical chart to obtain anthropomorphic information. Questionnaires included in this study were the anthropomorphic measures, uh, BMI, Z-scores, and BMI percentile were calculated with height and weight from the medical record, and FEV1 was collected. A demographic questionnaire, which asked about socio-demographic variables such as age, gender, marital status, of, and uh, home income of the caregiver. The U.S. Household Food Security Scale, and a study-specific measure which evaluated changes during the COVID-19 pandemic that was specifically related to nutrition um, and following nutritional recommendations. Adolescents completed two 24-hour diet recalls over the period of two weeks. Um, data from the diet recalls was entered into the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Food and Nutrition Database for Dietary Studies and was entered into real time into the ASA 24 program. Caloric intake and enzyme use were averaged across the two days to get a usual intake. Adherence to caloric recommendations was calculated by dividing the number of calories eaten by the number of calories recommended, or 120% of energy efficient ratio for age and sex. Adherence to enzyme use was calculated by dividing the number of meals where enzymes were taken by the number of meals where they were indicated. The majority of our patients were non-Hispanic white, and they were relatively evenly split between male and female. Some of our patients reported comorbid diagnosis, such as CFRD um, or liver disease. And about 80% of our participants were taking Trikafta. Caregivers were primarily mothers. They were married. Um, and we had a fairly wide range of education level and family income from families in this study. Average age of our adolescents was 14.76. Um, their BMI percentile was an average of 65.76. Um, however, about one third of our participants fell below the 50th BMI percentile for weight. Mean FEV1 was 99.7. On average, our adolescents ate about 2,719 calories a day, but this range was pretty significant with some eating as few as 1,000 calories and others eating as many as 6,000 calories per day. Mean adherence to calorie intake was about 95%. Um, however, about 60% of our participants did not meet their recommendation of 120% EOER. Um, about half of our adolescents reported that they did not take their enzymes as they should, um, or about 80% of the time, um, but mean adherence was about 83%. For the changes for the COVID-19 scale, um, a majority of families reported changes in their child's weight, how many snacks their child eats in a day, how their child received their clinical care, the structure of their child's routine, and how much time they spent at home during the COVID-19 pandemic. Specifically, 
families reported that their child's daily routine was less structured, that they had more telehealth visits, that their child ate more snacks, that their child's eating routines were generally less structured, and that their child experienced weight gain. As far as food security, 11% um, of our families reported marginal food security and 16% reported low security, um, indicating higher rates than the general population. And while the mean score was less than one, which would indicate high food security, the scores actually ranged from zero to seven. Independent samples t-tests and myvariate correlations were performed and regressionality analyses were conducted with food security and COVID-19 scores as predictor variables of nutritional adherence. No significant association was found for adherence to caloric intake or adherence to enzyme use based on the total score of changes during COVID-19 scale or the U.S. household food security scale. Overall, families reported changes to nutrition-related routines in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and it is likely that food security may inhibit compliance with dietary needs, such as trying to eat high-protein or high-fat foods. When a family faces economic challenges, parents and families may not be able to purchase adequate amounts of food or the medically necessary nutrition supplements or formulas most CF patients rely on in order to reach optimal nutrition. This study is somewhat limited by a small sample size, which would make it difficult to detect small to medium effects. Um, by not having a measure of food security prior to the start of the pandemic to compare to the current food security scale, and using a study-specific measure to measure changes during COVID-19. Additionally, participant recruitment occurred throughout the year, and it is likely that food security fluctuated for families in response to frequent changes in COVID-19 guidelines, um, the modality of which the kids went to school, whether it had been virtual or in-person or hybrid, um, and increased economic challenges that could have even potentially resulted in job loss at different times throughout the year. Finally, uh, prior research showed that households with food security, it, it is often that the caregivers for, forego meals in order to prioritize access to food for their children. Therefore, it's possible that nutritional adherence in teenagers was not as significantly impacted as other members of the family. Parents reported that weight, amount of snacks, and routines changed during the pandemic, um, but these changes were not directly significantly related to food security. Therefore, it's also possible that many of these families' food security status was stable during COVID, meaning if they were already food insecure, it stayed that way and vice versa. As ongoing research suggests long-term economic impact due to COVID-19, researchers should continue to evaluate how the pandemic may threaten food security in CF patients. CF providers are uniquely positioned to facilitate sensitive conversations with families um, and to routinely screen families for food security in order to address barriers and to provide education about nutritional resources that are available in their community or through programs like the CF Foundation. I'd like to thank my funding sources, um, including NIH, the CF Foundation for the Student Traineeship Award, and the American Psychological Association, my co-sponsors, Christina Duncan and Lori Stark, all of my wonderful site coordinators, and members of the WVU Splat Lab. Here are my references, and I'm happy to discuss anyone with anyone further about this project. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, I'd like to thank you for all this wonderful and impressive work. Uh, before we jump into some questions that we have for you, um, I want to address two different sub questions that were submitted or um, comments into the Q&A um, relating to the previous questions about um, PEP. It looks like there is an on-demand session that um, titled Applying Partnership Enhancement Communication Skills to Navigate Challenging Care Conversations. That might be helpful. Um, additionally, um, from Terry Schindler, who's part of the Food Security Committee, her group is preparing a virtual panel discussion in 2022 regarding sensitivity around screening and discussion 
for food insecurity in a clinic setting. So thank you, Terry. All right, Christine. So we have a, our first question for you here. Um, uh, let's see. <clears throat> Do you think that you may have exclu excluded a lot of minority CF patients by requiring them to be English speaking? Um, as minority families may have been impacted by COVID even more, would that have affected your data? I'm so glad that this question was asked, and, and thank you for uh, having me be a part of this presentation today. Um, I, I do think that that is a significant limitation of this study, um, was the aspect of having our patients need to be uh, English speaking. Um, I think that as we, uh, another thing that we wanted to consider was this project was launched during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, indicate, uh, meaning that the burden that's asking families that might um, have food insecurity or other limited resources at that time might have been a lot to ask to have them be a part of it. So you'll also see that our sample was predominantly white. It was a relatively high socioeconomic status. And I think that it likely the um, people being a part of the study was an, an increased burden during a time where families already had more limited resources. So if I were to you know, continue on with this study and continue to investigate uh, food insecurity in families, we'd absolutely want um, to include families who are not predominantly English speaking, um, who are of low, lower socioeconomic status. And that might mean studies that have less overall time commitment or burden for them and conducted in the, in the context of a, of a regular screening in clinic rather than an additional project that also has this, this telehealth component or this, this televideo conferencing component um, and other aspects that might've served as barriers for, for participation. Thank you, Christine. Thank you for that reflection. Um, do you have any suggestions for researchers or clinicians about how to include screening or measurement of food insecurity into their research or practice? I think that some of the wonderful resources that were discussed in the, in the previous discussion seem like wonderful places to start. Uh, I think that in somewhat our, our sample could have also underreported food insecurity. Uh, given some things that were already mentioned, just social desirability or a free of stigma. So I think that being able to screen within clinics with comfortable providers who are part of the team might be a great suggestion of places to start. Um, and I think that it's important for us to, to screen regularly and, and frequently. Um, one limitation as well of the study is that we only screen for food security at one time point. Whereas I think that it's likely that food security fluctuated quite a bit, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, and that it may be that while families are reporting higher food security at one point, um, other things may have come up that moved them into the category of lower food security at another point. So regular screening would be important, um, or potentially uh, screening your participants as part of a research study um, at multiple time points if you have multiple data collection time points. Okay. Thanks, Christine. We have a uh, question from one of our, our speakers. Um, how do you think food security for people with CF will be impacted as COVID specific resources go away? Yeah, I think that this is gonna be an important issue. I think particularly with um, families with, with children because I think oftentimes it's it's hard to come into a, a clinician appointment um, with, your, with your child or your teen and say that they need additional support for resources. So I think right now, um, everyone is doing a wonderful job of asking those questions, particularly because we are, are aware of the ways in which COVID has uh, economically impacted families. Uh, so I think that it, again, I just significantly encourage people to continue to ask these questions, particularly for families with, um, with kids uh, in, in these clinics so that they can get the support that they need. Um, and I, I hope that there, this is so, sort of um, a starting point for continuing to ask about food security rather than, um, you know, a, a, a blip with, with COVID and then um, that, that kind of reduces afterward. Well, again, thank you so much for um, this impressive work that you're doing. <clears throat> we really appreciate you sharing that with us today. Thank you. So, unless we, let's see, it, didn't, it doesn't look like we have any additional questions. So again, feel free to reach out to Christine if any questions continue to come up or come up after the presentation. So our, our third presenter today is Dee Dee Jennings. Uh, Dee Dee works with the University of Virginia Health as an adult CF social worker. She has a special interest in quality improvement and is passionate about health equity and addressing social barriers to health care. Dee Dee will be presenting on her team's implementation of routine social determinants of health screening and intervention process.
Hello, my name is Deirdre Jennings and I am the UVA Health Adult CF Social Worker. I have been with the CF team for about one year and with UVA Health for three. Social determinants of health and addressing barriers to care are a particular focus of mine and I have a special interest in quality improvement. Today, I'm going to be presenting our adult center's implementation of routine social determinants of health screening and intervention process to share both what our center learned from testing this process and to provide a template for implementing this process. There are no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. The World Health Organization's Commission on the Social Determinants of Health has defined SDOH as the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age, and the fundamental drivers of these conditions. Research suggests that the overall rate of food insecurity in the CF community may be as high as 26.3%, and while further research is needed to determine how other domains of SDOH impact people with CF, our center conducted research last year specifically to determine the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on SDOH for our patients. And our screening indicated that of the 76 patients who completed the screening, 22, so about 28.9%, answered yes to at least one question that indicated an undesired change in SDOH during the pandemic. We had two objectives for our testing of a routine screening. First, we wanted to screen patients for SDOH. And secondly, we wanted to be sure that those patients who did indicate social needs would be able to receive the support they needed. Accordingly, we developed the two SMART aims. First, increase routine screening of eligible patients for SDOH using the screening tool from 0% to 95% by the end of 2021. And second, increase follow-up rate within two weeks for those who screened positive for SDOH and indicated they would like assistance from 0% to 95% by the end of 2021. In 2020, our team designed an SDOH screening tool specifically to characterize how patients were impacted by the pandemic. This tool was the basis of the tool that we created for routine screening, which we called the Cystic Fibrosis Social Needs Screening version 1.0. The goal of the screening tool was to have a questionnaire that assessed for multiple domains of need. Domains of social need can be characterized very differently and in different screenings across the literature, you will see different domains used. For our purposes, any domains that would be redundant were not included. For example, um, the CFF already has guidelines around screening for mental health. Accordingly, version 1.0 of the screening included 18 questions across the following eight domains housing, food, transportation, utilities, healthcare costs, medication costs, income employment, and finally education. The team decided to test multiple screening methods to determine how screening can be incorporated into existing clinic processes. So we converted the tool for different screening methods. First, we have a paper instrument for in-person screening. We have an electronic document for screen sharing during telehealth appointments. And finally, we created a HIPAA secure Qualtrics online survey for asynchronous screening. This is our process map for our screening and intervention process. It begins in the upper left-hand corner with identifying patients appropriate for screening, which in our case was patients with a CF diagnosis currently being followed by our center. My chart is our HIPAA secure messaging system. For patients that have MyChart access, we sent them a message with a link to the online Qualtrics survey by MyChart. And if they didn't complete it after that first request, we sent them a reminder message. For those patients who do not have my chart or who did not complete the online survey after we sent them a reminder message, we completed the screening during a clinic visit, either by paper instrument or by a screen sharing, depending on the visit type. Once the screening was completed as the social worker, I would review the screening responses. And for patients who were positive for SDOH, which in our case we're defining as both reported that they had at least one social need and that they would like assistance, I would offer them an intervention. I would follow up either by my chart virtually, by phone or in person. Um, for anybody who did not indicate a social need, no follow-up is indicated. The screening process was tested through January of, and to March of this year, and we did a total of four PDSA testing cycles. The first three cycles refined the process for the online Qualtrics screening, and the final testing cycle began in-person screening and screen sharing. This graph shows the progress we made towards that 95% screening goal during our first 11 weeks, which were the weeks that we tested the screening process. You can see that in the first week, we had already screened 23% of eligible patients, and that is just from sending out that initial MyChart message with the online survey request. And then we saw another jump to 43% when we sent out the reminder message. 
And by the time we began screening patients during their clinic visits, 49.6% of all eligible patients had already completed the SDOH screening. What I really wanted to highlight with this chart was that the online survey was particularly effective for our center. You can see that we achieved about half of our eligible patients just from the online survey alone. And it has the advantage of being asynchronous. So if there is a patient who stopped coming to clinic or who is unable to make it, particularly because of social barriers, the asynchronous screening has the potential to catch that and give us an opportunity to address the barrier. As I was reviewing early screenings, I began to notice a trend in patients' concerns. So I decided to do a quick data check to see if the trend I suspected was correct. And this Pareto chart shows that of those patients who scored positive for social needs, the needs they reported were distributed unevenly across the eight domains, keeping in mind that some patients may have reported a need in multiple domains. These are domains of reported need for January through March. And the healthcare cost domain alone accounted for 44.8% of reported needs. And then when you combine healthcare costs and medication costs together, they accounted for 62.1% of social needs. I think the value of this chart is that it really clearly tells the story of where our patients are most likely to have needs. So when we as a center, we're looking at ways we might be proactive in supporting our patients, healthcare and medication costs jump right out as the areas where we could have the highest impact. This session focuses on food insecurity, but I think it's also important to keep in mind that in social needs, no single domain is isolated or separate from the rest of them. Limited income can mean patients are forced to choose between affording food and housing or paying for healthcare and medication. And addressing areas of highest need has the potential to improve other social domains as well. Keeping in mind that along with what we learned from our Pareto chart, the obvious choice for our center was an intervention that could help with healthcare costs and medication costs. UVA Health offers financial assistance that covers both healthcare costs and medications billed through our UVA pharmacy. And I decided to investigate and see if our patients were making use of this program. Of the 13 patients with healthcare cost concerns, eight were eligible for our financial assistance, but had been unable to get approved because they'd run into some sort of roadblock in the application process. And so the results from those 13 patients with healthcare costs suggested to me that we probably had other CF patients who had not yet completed the SDOH screening who might also be eligible for financial assistance. And upon investigation, about 45.5% of eligible patients were receiving UVA financial assistance as of March of 2021. So I began an intervention where I provided increased support to patients who were eligible for assistance to help them get approved. And as of September, about 76.2% of eligible CF patients are now receiving UVA financial assistance. So this is just an example of how implementing an SDOH screening can result not only in reactive interventions, depending on the needs identified in the screening tool, but also how using the data we get from that tool can allow us to create new pl clinic processes to pro proactively provide support to patients. By the end of March, we'd achieved a reliable screening process, but the other half of this project was, of course, providing interventions to those patients with needs, which meant that we also needed to test and focus on getting a reliable process for following up with patients who screened positive for SDOH. So we also tested the follow-up process January through March, and that resulted in an average follow-up rate of 52.9% within two weeks. And as I went back to try to investigate kind of what the challenges had been around the fall rate, I found that patients were reporting to me both that the screening tool as it was, that first version was generating both false positives and that some needs were not being captured by the screening tool. And based on feedback from patients, I hypothesized that if social needs were more accurately being captured, the fall rate would improve. What some of the patients told me was they weren't particularly motivated to respond to my attempts to follow up because they felt like the screening tool wasn't useful or wasn't capturing the right information. So they didn't really see a need um, to reach out or to respond when I tried to reach out. So we realized pretty quickly that the screening tool needed to be revised. And the screening tool was tested and revised from April to June of 2021, another four PDSA testing cycles. And the final version includes 21 questions across those same eight domains. The revision was based primarily off of feedback from patients, 
And as additional considerations we made for revisions were reviewing more screenings in the literature to better align our screening with recommendations from the literature. We also had uh, individual team members review as well as our patient partner and an outside expert. And this graph shows our progress towards our SMART aim of increasing our follow-up rate to that 95%. The blue line shows patients who did receive follow-up within two weeks, and the orange line is patients who did not receive follow-up within two weeks. So you can see that in January to March, as we were initially testing our follow-up rate, it was pretty significantly variable. And then in April, as we started revising the screening tool, it dropped back down. The thing I really wanted to highlight is in June, based off of patient feedback and reviewing screenings in the literature, we added one critical question. At the end, we added a question that said, if you answered yes to any of these questions, basically if you answered yes, indicating you had social needs, would you like to receive assistance? And once we added that question, our follow-up rate jumped from 75% to 100%, and it held steady at 100% for the next two months, which showed us that, yes, our hypothesis was correct. Having a better screening tool meant that our patients' follow-up rate with our patients also improved. These are our screening results as of September 15th of this year. You can see that we have not quite reached our 95%, but we are very close at 90.4%. And once again, for us, that online survey was really helpful. Of the 122 patients to complete the screening, 62 completed it by online survey. And of those patients who completed the screening, 42.6% scored positive for social needs. Obviously, we underwent several versions of this screening, but interestingly, this percentage of how many patients are positive for SDOH stayed pretty steady across the different screenings. What we concluded from this project was first that our SDOH screening tool is useful in identifying social needs in the eight domains we categorized, and that social needs screening is feasible via online survey, paper instrument, and by screen sharing in telehealth, which makes it possible to incorporate into existing clinic processes. I think that if there is just one takeaway of this project for any other centers implemented in input interested in implementing their own routine screening and intervention process, this is it. There are multiple effective screening methods, which makes it easier to incorporate the screening into existing clinic processes. For example, if your center already has a annual mental health screening process, this could just be added as an additional screening tool, or it could be added to a pre-visit planning questionnaire. The intervention test Intervention testing for this project focused mainly on ensuring we followed up with patients who requested assistance. So the next logical step after that is to see if our interventions are effective and which interventions may be more or less effective. Also, further testing is needed to see if interventions provided lead to a short or hopefully long-term change in social needs, which we could test via repeat screenings post-intervention. This concludes my presentation. I wanna say thank you to the entire UVA Adult CF Center interdisciplinary team, and a special thank you to our patient partner, Lauren Williamson, for supporting development of this screening tool and intervention process. And lastly, thank you to CF Center dietitian, Juliana Bailey from UAB for lending her expertise to our screening tool development. Here are the references for this presentation. And as I said, this is a particular focus of my work. So please don't hesitate to contact me with any questions related to this project. I am happy to answer to the best of my ability. Amazing work, Dee Dee. Amazing what you and your team at UVA are doing. You're, you're really pioneers in the social determinants of health space and your, <clears throat> your passion for health equity and addressing social barriers to, to health certainly come across in your work. Um, I really especially admire the work that you've done to break down um, the barriers to receiving these inter interventions, so well done. Um, we have a question from the audience. If you can remind us what platform you use for your online service. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to present on the work that the UVA Adult CF team has done. UVA Health actually has access, everyone at UVA Health has access to a HIPAA secure version of Qualtrics, so that is the platform that we used. And would you be willing to share the screening tool that you use? Um, I would have to ask the rest of my team members if we can share it because I think it is still undergoing while we've hopefully achieved a final version of it. I think one thing we're hoping to do is have it maybe transitioned into Spanish as well. 
and um, we only have English speaking uh, patients of our center, it just so happens. But so I think it's still undergoing a, maybe a final tweak for that. Um, would you mind sharing with us some of the challenges that your team faced when implementing the screening? Uh, I think the biggest challenge that we encountered was probably just um, curiosity or maybe um, confusion from patients around the screening. So our patients are pretty used to completing screenings because they complete the annual mental health screeners each year. And I think sometimes there's a risk of survey fatigue or burnout around that. And also, as um, Marissa alluded to in her presentation, there can be a bit of stigma around social barriers. So when you have one questionnaire that asks about a lot of potential social barriers, that's a lot of potential stigma and discomfort for patients. So usually the first thing I tell them is it's completely optional. You do not have to fill this out. And I think um, just reminding them of that. I've actually only had two patients in our center just completely flat out decline to fill it out because what I share with them is while it's totally optional and you don't have to fill it out, you can fill out all or part of it. Um, the, it really, it's there for them. And we talk about how there's a connection between social barriers and directly to your health care and your health outcomes. Because if you don't have enough to eat, if you don't have a stable place to stay, if your electricity is not turned on, you can't use your nebulizer, all of that's going to impact your CF care. So we're still trying to stay in our lane. We're still working with you towards your CF goals. And it's my job as your social worker just to make sure that I'm not missing anything and there's nothing falling through the cracks that I can't better be doing to support you and your goals. So I think just showing them that it's about them and it's about their CF care still and just normalizing the discomfort um, and validating some of the stigma that they can ha they have around that, I think that kind of creates more comfort for uh, patients and families around it. Absolutely. Um, I know you said you're gonna, this is something that you guys are going to work on and look more into in the future, but um, are there any interventions or resources that you've found most helpful when a social need is identified? Yes, yeah, so it that is something that I wanna do more testing on. So there are kind of two different categories that I think about our interventions as being, and I think that way because um, that's how the patients talk about them. So patients would talk to me about things like uh, gift bags, or for example, we have Kroger gift cards that we're able to give to patients with food insecurity. Um, and they would think of those as like short-term fixes. Like if they have a they have a utility bill that they're behind on and, we, and like I find a community resource to pay the bill one time, that's like a short-term fix. Um, and then the other category I would, I would put on is more like stabilizers and long-term fixes. So for example, when I was talking to patients about interventions, often they would be mo more motivated by something like, can you help me apply for disability? I really need to get that. Or can you help me apply for HUD housing choice vouchers? Because they see that as being a long-term goal and a long-term solution. So when I think about interventions, I would say the most popular with the patients are the long-term fixers because they see that as being a transition to, to stability for themselves and therefore stability for their health and for their families. Uh, however, those stopgap measures are really, really important because as every social worker probably knows, um, it can take months, years in order to um, get sometimes things like the HUD choice vouchers in place. So I'm hoping that by repeat screening our patients that we can get more information about if we, if we screen them and then we provide an intervention, for example, we help enroll them in food stamps or we help uh, enroll them in like a local Meals on Wheels or something. And then we screen again, we can see did the, did the intervention have a short or hopefully a long-term impact on um, their social needs status. So Didi, you mentioned uh, gift cards as one of your interventions. Um, so I wanted to go back to one of the questions that was asked earlier. Have you, in the process of providing um, <clears throat> of providing gift cards to your patients, have you worked with your legal department? Have you run into any issues? Do you have any tips for someone who, who is facing a barrier there? Um, yeah, our, our legal department's never had an issue with it. And that's not a CF clinic specific thing. That is something that UVA Health Social Work Department offers throughout the entire health system. So. I'm not sure. I think that an incentive would be something if you were asking, I can see the perspective of an incentive, but I would say that the definition of an incentive is typically uh, we ask them to fill out a screener and then we incentivize them filling it out by offering them the gift card. That's not what's going on here. We would give them the gift card regardless of whether or not they filled out the screener. So it might be worth going over with the legal department what their definition of an incentive is and just clarifying like how could we do this outside of an incentive. 
Um, we also are um, PFAC, our Patient and Family Advisory Council, or well, our PAC, um, they do offer some inpatient gift bags and stuff. And that is another potential way around it is by not doing it through the clinic, but by doing it through a patient advisory board. Thank you. Um, we have two more questions about the survey. So um, do you use questions from already existing validated measures or did you create the questions on your own? Yeah, so we, we reviewed a lot of already existing um, measures in the literature. One of my personal favorites is health leads, um, but there are a lot of great ones out there. Uh, we also, for the food insecurity ones in particular, um, there's a U.S. Um, household food insecurity uh, screening that has two validated questionnaires that they questions that they recommend healthcare centers use. So we use those. However, we did slightly modify them. So those questions and a lot of the existing questionnaires will ask questions and they'll say in the last 12 months or in the last year. And that's really useful for primary care where you're probably only seeing patients maybe once a year for an annual exam. In CF, it's still recommended we see them every quarter. So our screening does ask in the last three months. Uh, we did get some feedback from patients that if something was an issue seven months ago, but I've been working with them and I've seen them multiple times since then, they kind of don't want to answer a questionnaire about it again. So being mindful of what patients find to be most helpful and of potential survey fatigue, we decided to keep it within that quarter period. Great. All right, Dee, we have about just under a minute left of the Q&A. Um, so last question for you, how do you handle survey fatigue? Um, yeah, again, just kind of telling them they don't have to fill it out and also reminding them that that the survey is for them, it's not for us. And it's and I tell them that it's something specifically we developed to try to make sure that they have access to all, all the healthcare that they need and to make it really collaborative. So once they answer the survey, if they indicate they want help, then they really are the drivers of what kind of help they need and what would be most helpful. So I think by putting it in their hands and putting them in charge. Great, thank you so much, Dee. Thanks. All right, our next presenter is Lauren Weaver. Lauren is a full-time team member at Nemers Children's Health Delaware as a social worker, where she's worked for four years. While at the hospital, Lauren has served patients in different inpatient and outpatient roles and has been working with the Nemers CF team for two years. She received her MSW degree from Widener University in Pennsylvania and an undergraduate degree from Wilmington University in Delaware. Lauren will be presenting on addressing food insecurity and mental health in the COVID-19 pandemic. Hi everyone, I want to take a second and introduce myself. My name is Lauren Weaver. I'm a social worker at Nemours Hospital for Children in Delaware. I've been employed as a social worker at Nemours for about four years and I've worked with our CF care team for the past two years. I have no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. Our presentation is addressing food insecurity and mental health in the COVID-19 pandemic. Start out with a little background information. Um, as many of us know, families affected by CF are at greater risk for food insecurity for a number of reasons. Um, CF, as well as many other chronic illnesses are expensive. And supporting a child with a chronic condition is, can often be an additional burden to families. CF is a nutrition intensive diagnosis that can sometimes stretch a family's food budget pretty far. Additionally, patients and families with CF are at risk for increased mental health concerns. Management of CS can be very time consuming, very stressful and very difficult for a patient or their caregivers. Um, our CF care team became concerned about increases in food insecurity and mental health concerns for our patients pretty quickly at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. And as a result of that concern, we created a protocol for screening patients and providing resources. So I'll go into our screening tool. Myself and the CF team dietitian created a screening questionnaire and an algorithm for providing resources. Our screening process incorporated two validated tools, the hunger vital sign and the promise scale. And one additional question for both mental health and food insecurity was designed to address immediate concerns for families. The food insecurity screening tool. Some of you may be familiar with this, the hunger vital signs. Um, it's two questions and you can choose never true, sometimes true or often true. Those two questions are, within the past 12 months, 
Were you worried whether food would run out before you had money to buy more? And within the past 12 months, did the food you buy not last? And did you have not have money to buy more? A positive screen would have been sometimes or often true or in one or both of these questions. A positive screen would have resulted in us offering a food and security resource pack that we created. This packet included a list of local food banks for the family, information on benefit programs such as WIC or um, SNAP, and a handout on budget conscious shopping tips and recipes that can be used. So this was a good um, screening tool to get a baseline of where our families were and what was going on with them. Our COVID specific screening tool was um, created by myself and Michelle Reed, our dietitian. The scale for this was uh, one minimally concerned, high five, five being highly concerned. And on a scale of one to five, how concerned are you about feeding your family the next one to two weeks? We considered a positive screen to be a three or more. And this was really designed to see who was in immediate need of running out of food and how we could help. If you screen positive on this, we offered a grocery store gift card. These gift cards were either given out in person if it was available or they were mailed to the families. I'd like to go through a case example um, for one of our families that benefited from the food insecurity screening. Family A received a second screening call on September 15th, 2020. This family consisted of a mom, our patient who's a 15 year old female and a sibling, an 11 year old male. This family, in this family, the mother worked full time. She was self-employed. Um, however, at the beginning of the pandemic, she was out of work for approximately six to eight weeks because her job involved a lot of contact with people. She just wasn't working as, as much or at all for that time period. The family screened positive for food insecurity on the hunger vital screen and screened positive on our COVID specific question. As a result, the family received the food insecurity resources and the grocery store gift card. However, sort of an added bonus of these screening phone calls that came out was that while talking with this family, I was able to identify that this mom was really struggling with an electric bill. She had gotten behind in the payment, even though currently as of that September, she was working full time again and had been caught up on other bills. She had not been able to catch up on the electric bill and it was um, at risk of being shut off. So uh, we were able to make a referral to the Take a Breather Foundation, their COVID relief fund, and was able to get that bill paid for them. They were wonderfully appreciative of the support and grateful to um, the Take a Breather Foundation as well. Our mental health screening tool. So we used the promise scale, um, a couple, two questions from that. The scale would have been one being poor, five being excellent. Those two questions are, in general, how would you rate your mental health, including your mood and ability to think? And then in general, how would you rate your satisfaction with maintaining connections to family and friends? A positive screen would have been three or less. And if they screen positive for some mental health concerns, we offered the emotional well-being resource list. This list was created by myself and the CF psychologist, Dr. Cantor. This included a list of free resources for self-care, stress management, relaxation techniques, online resources that supported physical health, and our physical therapist helped us come up with those, and the crisis hotline information if that was needed by the family. For our COVID-specific mental health question, we scaled this on one to five, one being minimally distressed, five being highly distressed. On the scale of one to five, how distressed are you about COVID-19? So a positive screen for this would have been a three or more. And if they screened higher than a three or more, we refer them to the CF psychologist if they were interested. A case example from our mental health screener. Family B re received their first screening on April 21st, 2020. I conducted the screening with our patient's parents. This family consisted of two parents, a patient, a 16 year old female, and one sibling, a 13 year old female. When I was conducting the screening, the parent indicated high levels of anxiety and depression in the home by both parents and um, both patients. The family did accept the mental health resource list and provided us with a lot of good feedback about it. They utilized a lot of the resources on the list. Um, and as a result, our patient was able to be referred to our CF psychologist and she was able to meet with her regularly throughout the summer of 2020 and found that to be very helpful. Our screening process. Our goal was to attempt to screen each family three times between the spring of 2020 and March, 2021. 
Initial screenings were completed by phone. Second and third rounds of screening were done in a combination of phone calls or in-person visits when the families or patients were in clinic. We did come across um, a barrier to our screening. The biggest barrier in the screening process was reaching our young adult patients. And those are the patients in the age range of 18 to 21. And the, the barrier was reaching them by phone. The screenings became more successful when the patients did return to clinic and we were able to see them in person. A lot of times we would call and leave messages and didn't get follow-up phone calls back. I'd like to go over our results. The food and security screening results. So over the course of the three rounds, 250 screenings were attempted with 214 successful screenings, about 85% of the screens we did, which I thought was really wonderful. Uh, the majority of our patients completed screenings in all three rounds. During at least one screening, eight families screened positive for food insecurity, and six families expressed an immediate need for concern in accessing food. So that meant overall, nine families did receive food insecurity resources from our team, including the distribution of six grocery store gift cards. Um, also really important to note is that four families, because of these screenings and the resources we provided them, were successfully able to apply for SNAP benefits and did receive them. Our mental health screening results. During at least one screening, 21 patients screened positive on the PROMISE scale and 46 patients screened positive for COVID-specific anxiety. 32 patients accepted the emotional well-being resource list from me and 13 patients were referred to our CF psychologist. In conclusion, the screenings were really well received by all of our patients and their families. Everyone appreciated having that personal connection to our CF clinic in a time where they weren't able to see us in person. The screenings provided an opportunity to reach out to families and gave them the opportunity to discuss with me if they had an additional need outside of our algorithm. One example of that was that during our third round of screenings, which would have been um, like November, December, and into January, families were able to discuss with me any concerns they had regarding the holidays or meals in that area. And I was able to provide holiday support to them. Our team plans to use the knowledge we gain from this experience to continue to provide meaningful support to our families and clinic. Myself and the dietitian are currently working on a way to implement regular food screenings and clinic visits and are researching opportunities to partner with local food banks. Thank you all so much for your interest um, and for listening to my presentation. Thank you, Lauren, uh, for the work that you've done for sharing your data on food insecurity and mental health. Mental health has become a priority in CF recently, and especially with the onset of COVID, we've heard more and more um, about the importance of addressing mental health and addressing food insecurity. So mm -hmm. thank you for this work that you've done. Um, so I think a lot of teams would uh, love to provide gift cards, but maybe you don't know how to go about getting funding. Um, we had a, did have a question earlier about working with the legal department to provide gift cards. Um, and as part of the food security committee, we get a lot of requests for um, helping to fundraise or um, suggestions on how to fundraise or raise money for um, the ride for these gift cards. So would you mind sharing um, how your CF center obtains funding for the grocery store gift cards? Sure. Um, specifically for the gift cards that we were giving out um, during this time, we had a donation that came from a previous family um, of our CF center, and that funding was set up into an account for to be used for patient care purposes. So at the beginning of the pandemic, our team came together and decided that this was um, meaningful to us, and that's where we wanted to allot some of that funding to go. Um, in the future, we're hoping to utilize some fundraising with our um, our FAC, they've expressed interest in fundraising for toy drives and different things to support our families. So that's how we hope to continue this. We also, um, for, for um, clinics that are looking to give out gift cards, we worked very closely with our compliance department um, and our legal department. So there is in Delaware, there is a cap of an incentive that can be given out. So we track the amount of gift cards we're giving to each patient and family um, in a hospital-wide tracking system. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so question about the mental health questions. Were they asked to both caregivers and patients? 
So, um, the questions in the phone calls, we were targeting towards caregivers for our younger patients, anybody under 18. While we were doing that, I always asked about the mental health of the patient specifically when we were doing the interviews. We were also working very hard to make sure that we were getting all of our annual mental health screenings done at that time um, during whether it was um, an in-person visit or if we were able to connect with a team by phone. So we were having that check-in. For our 18 and older patients, we did reach out to them specifically unless they had given us permission to reach out to parents. Thank you. Um, there was a question asking if we can show the slide about emotional health resources again. Um, unfortunately, we can't share slides, but please reach out to Lauren. I'm sure mm -hmm. she'll be able to share. Yeah, we compiled that list from um, specifically from the social work department. Anytime that we got a resource that was virtual, there was a lot of stuff going around, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. We created an um, ongoing list of tools that were available, whether it was like um, free trials or if a resource was made free during the pandemic, specifically um, virtual, um, like yoga sessions, things like that were really helpful. Um, Lauren, do you guys have a, do you and your team have a long-term plan to continue to address food insecurity in your clinic? Um, at this time, we are working towards a long-term plan. We want to continue screenings um, in person, regularly, routinely during clinics to continue to offer, um, whether it's food banks in the area, gift cards if we can. Um, so that's something we are working to get implemented at the quarterly screenings. And I think we can go back to an earlier question that was asked as well. Um, do you mind sharing how, if you work with community-based organizations that address food insecurity, programs like Meals on Wheels, for example? We didn't work um, specifically with the um, like our CF clinic. We didn't work closely with any outside agencies. We were using the funding that was donated to us to purchase the gift cards. I know hospital-wide, there's been a lot of work towards partnership with um, different agencies, such as like the Food Bank of Delaware. We tried to do keep a close communication open when they were doing um, drive-by food pantries. So that way that information got disseminated to us and we could disseminate it to patients quickly. All right, thank you so much, Lauren. Um, we appreciate you, everything that you're doing and you for sharing thank this you. with us. So our final speaker today will be Dr. Rebecca Neville. Dr. Neville is a pediatric pulmonologist at the University of Missouri Women's and Children's Hospital. She completed her medical doctorate her pediatric residency and chief residency at the University of Missouri. Her fellowship training in pediatric pulmonology was completed at Vanderbilt University. Dr. Neville has interests in a broad range of pulmonary disorders with multidisciplinary approaches to care, including aerodigestive conditions, cystic fibrosis, childhood interstitial and diffuse lung diseases, and chest wall deformities. Today, Dr. Neville will be presenting on the impact of the COVID pandemic in a food pantry on food insecurity at her pediatric CF center. Hello, my name is Dr. Rebecca Neville and I'm presenting our research on the impact of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic and a food pantry on food insecurity in a pediatric cystic fibrosis center. I have no relevant disclosures to discuss. Food insecurity is defined by the U.S. Department of Agriculture as a household level economic and social condition of limited or uncertain access to adequate food. According to the Missouri Hunger Atlas, 12.8% of homes in the state of Missouri are considered food insecure. Caloric needs of children with cystic fibrosis are known to be higher than in children without cystic fibrosis. This can increase the general cost to support a child with cystic fibrosis. The recent global SARS-CoV-2 pandemic may increase financial stressors for families. The hypotheses for our study were threefold. First, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic will affect the rate of food insecurity in our CF population. Second, children who are provided with access to adequate nutrition through an in-clinic cystic fibrosis food pantry will demonstrate a decrease in reported food insecurity. And third, after implementation of an in-clinic cystic fibrosis food pantry, there will be a decrease in percent of patients with at-risk nutritional status, that is a weight for length or a BMI percentile less than the 50th. Families in our CF center were anonymously screened for food insecurity 
using standardized questions for food insecurity. This screening occurred six months prior to and six months after onset of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. This two question screening included the following statements. Within the past 12 months, we worried whether our food would run out before we got money to buy more. And within the past 12 months, the food we bought just did not last and we did not have money to get more. Families were offered the following options, often true, sometimes true, never true, or I don't know from which to select their answers. Positive screenings were counted if often true or sometimes true were selected. An in-clinic food pantry was then established for our Pediatric Cystic Fibrosis Center through grant support from the Leda J. Sears Charitable Trust at the University of Missouri Child Health Research Institute. This food pantry had an inventory of high calorie, high fat, high salt, nutritious, and shelf-stable foods and supplements. Food insecurity screening was then repeated six to 12 months after implementation of the CF food pantry. Pre and post intervention weight for length and BMI data were analyzed. The results of the food insecurity portion of this study, again, based on screening before onset of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, six months after onset of the global pandemic, and then six to 12 months after the intervention of a CF food pantry are as follows. As figure one shows, pre-SARS-CoV-2, 50% of families screened positive for food insecurity. This remained stable at 50% after onset of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, but improved to 16% of families screening positive for food insecurity after establishment of our CF food pantry. This was a statistically significant improvement. Regarding this nutritional status portion of the study, patients were counted as at-risk nutritional status if weight for length or BMI percentile was less than the 50th. This was calculated before onset of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, six months after onset of the global pandemic, and then again, six months after food pantry intervention. Patients before and after the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic demonstrated an at-risk nutritional status, 23 to 27% of our population. This decreased to 13% after establishment of a CF food pantry. This result, again, was statistically significant. Additional results that we found during this study were that 75% of surveyed participants reported that the CF food pantry did improve their food security status. 32% of families reported that the pandemic affected their food security. And only half of those families who were reported to be food insecure stated that they had access to other food assistance programs. In conclusion, food insecurity is a challenge for about half of families, both before and after onset of the global SARS-CoV-2 pandemic within our CF Center. A third of families reported that the viral pandemic affected their level of food security. Although nutritional support programs are available nationally, only half of those families who are food insecure in our center reported access to food assistance programs. This may provide some opportunity for future intervention to improve food security. Following implementation of an ink clinic, food pantry, there was a reduction in families screening positive for food insecurity, a decrease in the percent of patients with at-risk nutritional status, and a majority of surveyed families reporting that the food pantry improved their food security status. I want to acknowledge again the support of the Leda J. Sears Charitable Trust at the University of Missouri Child Health Research Institute for assistance with the CF Food Pantry. I'd also like to thank the families that participated in this study. Thank you, Dr. Neville, for your work in this great presentation. You have really brought us full circle from Marissa's presentation on the desire of the CF community to receive support from food pantries.
um, to the work that your team has done. And it's really amazing to see the, the, the rate drop from 50% to 16. That's incredible. So thank you for presenting today. So to start off, we have a few logistical questions for you about the pantry. Um, did each family receive the same food supplies in each bag? So thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, so we did not start provide exactly the same thing in each bag. Um, it varied visit to visit. Um, we did provide a food pantry bag to every patient when they came into clinic, regardless of their reported food security status. And part of this was because it was an anonymous screening. And so we didn't know who was food insecure and who was not. We just provided it across the board to all patients. It also reduced that risk um, of stigmatization that potentially um, was something that was brought up earlier because again, every patient was provided a, these food bags so that they were not um, individually able to be identified as they left clinic. Um, and so, um, but week to week or visits to visit, uh, they are, the um, food that was provided in each bag varied, but it was all, um, it was all uh, some component of high fat, high um, salt, nutritious food. And is your, your pantry still ongoing? It is. We currently still have funding through um, this grant, and so it is still ongoing right now. Great. Great. You have you have some great comments coming in in the, in the Q and A. Um, someone said, "This is amazing." It is. So, um, where did you get the funding for this food pantry? A couple questions here. So, where did you get the funding, and who managed the supplies? <laughs> So um, again, we got we applied for this grant through um, the Child Health Research Institute at within our department, um, the our child life department or child child health department. Um, as far as who stocked and provided food, the dietitian that works within our CF center provided a list of food items and shelf stable recommended highly nutritious foods that would be recommended to keep stocked within um, the food pantry. And then I actually purchased the food and we had a um, child uh, children's hospital volunteer that would pack the bags every week because we have a pretty active um, volunteer program through our hospital. There are a couple questions about um, what types of things you have in the food pantry? Can you give some examples? Yeah. So um, we did, we um, had some canned fruits and vegetables. We did have some canned, um, canned um, um, beans and some other um, canned items. We also um, kept a pretty good stock of uh, like uh bars like granola bars, um, that were high, high, um, kind of well-rounded as far as nutrition, nutritional support. Um, and then we did have, even for our infants who were not on full, uh, foods yet, we would have, um, lots of baby food items that were also provided with olive oil to add and mix in for additional, um, fat content and, and that type of support. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think it does. Thank you. Um, another person said, but just commented on how amazing it is what you've done and just that decrease <laughs> in food insecurity after the use of the pantry. Um, so, but the question they were wondering is if you know how frequently each family was using the pantry, the ones who reported in food insecurity. So again, we, we kept the survey anonymous and just that brief two question survey each time we did it. So we screened each family three times, um, which was helpful to have that, again, a, the brief version of the survey. And I think this came up um, in both uh, Christine Durkin's and uh, Dee Dee Jennings' presentations about how to re-screen multiple times without that um, uh, fatigue, screening fatigue. Um, so we, we used just that two-question survey. And... Um, our, um, our ability to, um, provide that, um, the bags to every family, regardless of how they screened, um, was kind of self-fulfilling, if you will. So the patients who were at potentially at risk nutritional status, obviously are brought back to clinic more frequently. So they receive more bags. 
um, if, if that makes sense. So, you know, if they're coming back monthly, they would get a bag monthly. If they're coming back every three months, they would get a bag every three months. And there's another question about, <clears throat> about what you have stocked in your pantry. Are you able to stock fresh fruits and vegetables? No, um, everything was supposed to be, we made the decision that everything should be shelf stable. And do you have plans for the sustainability of the food pantry after your grant concludes? Um, not yet. It's something that is in process, but we do not have a grant to pick up where this one leaves off yet. We still have sufficient funding, um, for another couple of a year or two. Um, where is your food pantry located? Is it inside of your CF clinic? Um, it's right next to our CF clinic. And so, um, the morning of our multidisciplinary clinic, we just bring the bat, bring the number of bags down that we have patients and have it available. So as the patient leaves clinic, we can just hand them out. Um, how many patients do you see in your CF clinic? Um, like per week, probably 12 ish. How many do you have in total? In our CF center? I actually don't no off the top of my head. That's okay. That's okay. Um, I think one more question for you, unless some more come in. Um, any chance, are you changing the contents of the food bag for patients taking highly effective modulators? That's a great question. We've had some ongoing discussion about this. Um, we have not yet. And um, right now, the way that we are um, providing the bags are we're providing an infant either an infant bag option or an older child option, um, kind of regardless of what their, um, again, regardless of their food security status or um, their BMI. But that may be something that as we learn more about um, long-term health on these highly effective modifiers, maybe something we need to address. Um, one question, last question I have for you. Um, do you have any advice or tips for others who are wanting to start their own food pantry? Um, do it. Our kids love it. It's really funny when you bring their bags in, the kids are like immediately digging in, wanting to see what treats they got for that, that visit. Okay. Well, it looks like we have a couple more questions coming in. Um, let's see. Does every patient receive the same food items? Yes, they do. Um, have any families declined the bags? Um, so we have had a maybe one or two that have declined a bag. Like they said, you know, we don't need it um, this time, save it for someone else. So we have had some families decline, um, but it's honestly not very, not very common. Um, it looks like there's a second part to that question. If, if the, if the, what's in the bag changes based on the number of family members. No, to date, we have just provided um, the same amount, regardless of um, size of family, or again, um, because it's anonymous, even severity of their um, support needs, um, we've just kind of provided the same, same bag for everybody. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Neville, for the work you're doing and for your presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, so thank you everybody for coming to this workshop. It looks like there were a lot of great resources, links and suggestions for posters to see and more um, in the chat. So if you haven't taken a look at that, please check it out. Um, we also encourage you to contact any of our speakers or Emily or myself with any questions that we weren't able to get to today or those that come up after the session. As a reminder, you can find the many different resources Marissa shared in the my.cff resource library. The Food Security Committee is also available to support you, and you can contact us at foodinsecurity at cff.org. Um, on behalf of Emily and myself, we'd like to thank all of our speakers today and our audience for your engagement and your questions. Have a great rest of your day.